ASEAN Dailies, first and foremost news from Southeast Asia. Welcome back to Triana ASEAN, the voice of discovery and sharing. And good morning to all of you on Wednesday. So, let's start with the ASEAN Dailies, where we deliver news and also discuss the news uh, from Southeast Asia. So, the first news is about Malaysia, where uh, there is this news about eight potential candidates to replace Bank Negara Governor Tan Sri Zeti Akhtar Aziz. So, there are only some like four months left until the current Bank Negara Malaysia's governor uh, ends her five-year term as the uh, central bank's governor before taking the top spot at uh, this Bank Negara in 2000. Zeti served as a central bank's deputy governor. So, there are rumors, uh, rightful recently that Zeti was under pressure to resign from her post following BNM and her involvement in a task force investigating, uh, a money trail linked to 1MDB. However, she broke her silence in August and she dismissed the speculation by announcing that she will stay on until her term ends in April 2016. So, uh, last month, Zeti did mention, uh, that her successor will be ident- identified, uh, by end January. And also, she urged the governor's committee to reach a decision at least three months before the appointment of a new governor. So, let's see, uh, what, what, what are the things that, uh, what are the list of candidates uh, that could become the next central bank governor? And this is according to Bloomberg. So, one, is that took Dr. Awang Adet Hussein, who is the uh, Malaysian ambassador to the U.S. And second candidate is Tan Sri Muhammad Arwan Serga uh, Abdullah, who is the Secretary General to the Treasury at the Ministry of Finance. Third uh, candidate is that took Muhammad Ibrahim Bihanem Ib- Deputy Governor, fourth Datuk Noor uh, Shamsia Muhammad Yunus, who is also a uh, BNM Deputy Governor. A uh, fifth one is Dr. Sukhdeep Singh, who is also BNM uh, Deputy Governor. And sixth one, Datuk Sori Abdul Wahid Omar, who is the Minister in the Prime Minister's Department. And the last two candidates are Tansri Datuk Patuka Ismi Ismail who is the uh, chief executive and also MDB, one MDB board of director. And lastly, that took Dr. No Azian Ghazali, who is a BNM member of a monetary policy committee. So those are the potential uh, eight uh, candidates uh, after Azeti's uh, Term, term is terminated. So uh, we'll continue our uh, news on the political news of Southeast Asia after the short break. So stay tuned. ASEAN Dailies, first and foremost news from Southeast Asia. Welcome back to Duryana ASEAN. You're with Grace at ASEAN Dailies, where we deliver news from Southeast Asia. Now, let's still uh, stay in Malaysia. Apparently, uh, Malaysia has pledged to take about 3,000 Syrian asylum seekers over the next three years. But refugee groups hope that its invitation will also be extended to the more than 10, uh, sorry, 1,000 Syrian refugees already on the Malaysian soil. So there are so quite a number of, uh, refugees flooding in, into, uh, Malaysia. And of course, Malaysia does welcome, uh, families or friends or other parts of refugees to Malaysia. So the first group of 3,000 Syrians whom he hopes to eventually provide a temporary shelter uh, to over the next three years. And uh, it is very bad. At least every day is um, sort of they are going through a struggling like a war and also bombing in the area. And Syria has been uh, ravaged by the civil war for nearly five years, forcing millions out of the uh out of the country in search for safer shows. So uh, 
this country, Malaysia, has offered to be one of these havens uh, until things improved back home. And it has pledged, uh, like I mentioned before, to take a 3,000 Syrian asylum seekers over the three, next three uh, years. So these two families were brought over after their Syrian relatives working in Malaysia appealed uh, to the Malaysian government for help. And newly formed the special task force is working out details uh, for future as, as Syrian arrivals as well. The government wants to help Syrians coming through this program to get work permits, as well as enabling them to be self-sufficient. Uh, well, Malaysia is not exactly a signatory to the United Nations Refugee Convention and Refugees under the, the UNHCR often work here illegally or survive on NGO support until they either return home or resettle elsewhere. So uh, one of them, uh, a Syrian refugee, uh, according to him, I asked the government of Malaysia to accept us and to give us permission to work here and live until Syria gets the same luck before we can go back there. And they also really, really hope that Malaysia government opening its doors to the 3000 means it will open its ears and hearts to the ones who are here. So there are lots of problems, uh, especially when it comes to accepting refugees. Uh, that is, we are talking about the Syrian asylum seekers. Uh, of course, Germany has accepted and are providing lots of other temporary shelters and also uh, generating a funding for these people. And in Malaysia, we also need to, well, helping them is a very good uh, step. But how are we going to maintain them? How are we going to uh, take care of them uh, for quite for a period of time? That's another question about the accommodation, the food and what, what they need to need at the rate. Uh, rest. So the, is, this issue is not definitely as easy as we think to solve, but it seems that the government is looking at it. So all the best. And, uh, uh, it is important to uh, really prioritize on the national security. Uh, and also, uh, according to the news here, there will be a strict vetting process for any refugees to be accepted from Syria. So now moving on to the next news of a human rights are sidelined in the Philippine uh, presidential race. What's happening here is Philippine res presidential uh, candidates have ignored human rights in their campaigns despite the violence which plagued the country. So the right group spoke out as a survey was released showing the front runner uh, for the 2016 poll was a mayor dubbed Dirty Harry who was openly boasted of a personally killing criminals. And of course, uh, Amnesty International uh, in Philippines said it asked the five leading presidential hopefuls to give them a copy of their human rights agenda, but not comp complied despite repeated requests. So it is very unfortunate the challenge has not been accepted as AIP has yet received word from the offices of uh, pres presidential candidates regarding the human rights platform. And there will there were also a survey, but before that, the Southeast Asia has seized the numerous killing of journalists, political figures, and also petty criminals as well. So this is something that is very cruel and definitely definitely goes against the human rights. A survey released just a few days ago, saying that uh, revealed. Uh, Duarte, the longtime mayor of Davao, leads his rivals in the race to succeed this Aquino. And as the, the report of the Human Rights Watch said, uh, Duarte is also called the Davao's death squad, had killed more than a thousand people during his tenure as mayor of city on the southern uh, part of Mindanao. So there are lots of killing and it's all very, uh, bad ethical behavior when it comes to uh, ruling the country or country the one nation. They have to understand where the Filipino people are coming from. But we don't believe that to get the peace and order, you need to extra judicial executions. You don't need to have this shortcut. 
uh, to achieve what you want to achieve. So this is pretty uh, unethical and it definitely goes against the human rights that we are facing at the moment in the Philippines. Well, let's travel uh, to the Thailand. Thailand will not commit to this fly, uh, climate finance, apparently. Uh, they are at the situation of uh, refusal to commit to any financial assistance for undeveloped countries' effort to combat climate change. Uh, Deputy Delegation Leader to the Paris Talk, uh, Prasad uh, Serena Porn, said Thailand believed the developed countries should accept the responsibility for funding developed developing countries' effort to reduce greenhouse emissions. And his commitment came in the second week of 21st session of the Climate Call, a conf- Conference of the Pari- uh, Parties, which is COP21. So definitely it is still on the, under a discussion and a debate. Uh, and the wording is objectable to the 134 developing countries of the G77 and China who insist developed countries have an obligation to provide this funding as they were historically responsible for greenhouse gas emissions for sure. And uh, the final uh, text of the draft uh, agreement from COP is expected to emerge by this Friday. But then again, Thailand has pledged to cut the greenhouse gas emission 20 to 25 percent by 2030, and government budget funding will be required. But to achieve that goal, definitely international climate finance is also needed. But currently, Thailand is confirmed to receive 14.7 million euros. That's about 570 million baht from nationally appropriate uh, mitigation actions fund to promote energy efficient refri- uh, refrigeration and also uh, air conditioning device in between 2015 to 2019. So, uh, according to them, again, developed countries must take into account that the capacity of developing countries was not at all the same level and also at the same time the position to do so from developed countries could refer to the MERV solution but they also must meet on the middle track between developed and developing countries. There's a very, very, very crucial that developed countries, they can push ahead with financial aid but also at the same time, developing countries, which have the capability, should also contribute so that the whole this ambitious climate target can be achieved. And of course, there, there was a transparency provisions for a finance spending would be ensured by the system of inventories and the U.S. would continue its high level of funding. And last news before we end our news commentary on the political side of Southeast Asia is uh, about uh, the ASEAN uh, apparently told to push for stronger, stronger adaptation measures in the climate deal. And this is, of course, the continuation of the previous news commentary where calls for the adaptation uh, Asian countries uh, mounted after release of the latest draft of a Paris climate deal. It was just a last uh, last week. So such as a sea uh, level rise, cost of flooding, salt water intrusion related to climate change also threaten farming in major deltas, potentially affecting the lives and livelihood to some about 3.5 to 5 million people there. An international organization, uh, Oxford, has been at the front, a uh, forefront of calls to address the adaptation gaps for developing countries, most of which are in East Asia, particularly member countries of this East uh, ASEAN regions countries. So there is a poor communities in Asia bear the brunt and they continue to suffer from this effect of climate change that threatened food production, but exposing already marginalized communities to more vulner- uh, vulnerable uh, abilities. But yet, these communities have the least responsibility for causing this climate change. So these are the uh, things that ASEAN really, really needs to push uh, when it comes to climate change. And uh, we can do better as 10 uh, 
nations that climate change is threatening Asia. So all the government should、uh, come together, work together, and find consensus with、uh, our own negotiating blocks to push for strong welfare of Asians in the in the Paris deal. So I、uh, will take a very short break. When we come back, we'll discuss and also deliver news on economic side of Southeast Asia. <music> ASEAN Dailies, first and foremost news from Southeast Asia. Welcome back to Durian ASEAN. You're with Grace and ASEAN Dailies. And hi, this is Gauri. Also joining you on ASEAN Daily this morning. So、uh, this、uh, segment will be focusing on economic news of Southeast Asia. So apparently there is this news about the U.S. temporarily lifts Myanmar's shipping、uh, restrictions, and、uh, of course they will be、uh, easing the restriction on the trade via、uh, Myanmar's ports. And there was a post. Election move to welcome, which was just yesterday,、mm-hmm. by business leaders in the economically booming Southeast Asian nations, and of course this policy comes after the Myanmar uh, uh, held landmark poll last month.、Uh, it was、uh, by、uh, of course Aung San Suu Kyi's National League for Democracy, and also will make easier for U.S. companies to deal directly with the country's crucial ports and airports, which is very a、uh, positive news because Myanmar. Was always been sort of、uh, blocked themselves mm-hmm, mm-hmm.、Uh, from having foreign investors coming in and also dealing directly with other countries.、Uh, it is a big, a giant step forward、uh, when it comes to economic growth, and、uh, they are, will be welcoming U.S.、Uh, to、uh, sort of、uh, which will help them to ease the restriction on the ports and also airports.、Mm-hmm. And this is definitely a good opportunity for、uh, the country、uh, and also. So,、uh, like you were saying,、uh, how they have been blocked all this while. I think they have been living in a closed system for at least the last 50 years, and、right. without、uh, any proper access to international business, international trade.、Uh, and right now, they're opening up to more、mm. uh, foreign businesses to come in.、Uh, they're more open to foreign trading, and it's definitely、uh, a step forward for Myanmar and、uh, give it more way、uh, to develop as a、yep. country. And the main young one part. Uh, is run by Asia World, which is one of the country's largest conglomerates,、uh, owned by Stephen Law.、Uh, and Asia World is actually one of the richest firms and has a very vast network of interest across、uh, Myanmar and the firm. Uh, had declined to comment, however, but a U.S. embassy spokesperson、uh, said that the temporary easing was a technical fix to ensure that、uh, exports to and from Myanmar can be continued. But、uh, this aside, I think、uh, the important thing here to note is that Myanmar is definitely. Uh, moving forward,、uh, going towards the change、uh, that they were hoping for, and、uh, of course, Aung San Suu Kyi won the elections.、Mm-hmm. Uh, there is some complications <coughs> over there,、uh, but they are opening up their countries. They are、right. easing on the restrictions, and、uh, definitely this.、Uh, Can will make Myanmar、uh, equally as competitive as the other ASEAN countries. Yes, uh, that's uh, definitely for sure. And also, there will be relationship between U.S. and Myanmar at the same time.、Uh, taking steps、uh, one by one is very important, especially when country is facing the transition period from、uh, military to、uh, democracy. And she was elected Aung San Suu Kyi, and she is now the leader of the whole nation. A lot of expectation is. Is falling on her shoulder at the moment, and uh, this uh, uh, dealing with the U.S. and they are helping Myanmar to fix certain problems and issues, and、uh, like they mentioned that、mm-hmm. uh, the temporary easing was technical fix. So、uh, step by step, where they really need to strengthen their fundamental、um, structure to be able to push. The Push themselves forward. So it's something that、uh, we can look forward to hearing from them again in the future. So next news is about. Uh, uh, 
um, GDP growth, uh, that Asia's trade growth has sort of lagged behind this growth. Uh, this is according to the Asian Development Bank. The lag is due to structural factors such as China's rebalancing and also slower expansion of the global value chart. And um, like I mentioned, that this is uh, due to the structural factors such as uh, the the global value chains may have to, uh, reached a stage where it is taking a break. Mm -hmm. uh, that's according to ADB's chief economist, uh, Shang Jinwei. And he also mentioned that it's a temporary uh, break or permanent break. Uh, whether it is or either of that, they will have to wait and see. But one of these ways that, that they see from the data is the reduction in the growth rate of trade mm -hmm. happens more than the Im immediate uh, parts and components trade than for a final good trade. Right, and I think well, what's uh, what ADB has noted here is also that China's increasing role uh, of uh, contributing to the economy is affecting the regional economic growth. And we cannot deny that China does play yeah. uh, a huge part when it comes to s determining how Asia's economy yep. is, is doing or uh, where it's going uh, in the future. Uh, and even comparing a six-year period before the global financial crisis in yeah. 2008 and six years after, you can see very clearly how how uh, China is affecting the whole growth in Asia. And ADB also found that China's impact on Asian growth has actually increased from 16% to 24%. Um, and uh, other countries that also sort of uh, play an important role apart from China is Singapore, uh, Indonesia, South Korea, and Taiwan. And all these different countries, of course, have their own strength. I mean, Singapore is a small country, but technologically they are so advanced and they uh, always have st uh, uh, up-to-date uh, technology and uh, facilities. Yep. Whereas if you look at Indonesia, they have a massive uh, population and uh, they contribute uh, in terms of manpower and South Korea and Taiwan as well. Uh, the working culture there is different uh, and I think all these countries, however they're doing, it definitely has an impact uh, on Asia as a whole. And speaking of that, even uh, ASEAN itself, uh, of course we make up part of Asia with all the 10 countries uh, that we have and we're also trying really hard to be more competitive mm. to make it mm. easier to access uh, to open up uh, and signing uh, trade deal agreements and all and hopefully with that uh, things will look forward uh, next year uh, and we will be able to contribute to the uh, Asian economy yes um, you're right there that these four countries have been contributing to uh, this whole economic growth but they are also so countries that are, are quite affected by China as uh, the whole uh, the contribution as well, and that they are the one who mm. also rely on China's growth, right. which is very tricky because once China is uh, uh, China is becoming uh, China becomes very fragile when right. it comes to economic growth. The whole nation, neighboring countries, are also very much affected. So. It's really important to build this good relationship with China. Mm. But again, like I mentioned, it's very tricky because we have our internal issues and the external sort of relationship issues with China. And that comes with a lot of uh, the long term issues such as the South China Sea. And we also have a lot more uh, uh issues that includes in this uh, ASEAN region. So um, put that aside, but then economic growth is uh, one of the uh, important part when mm -hmm. it comes to uh, uh, the GDP growth. So uh, we'll uh, look out at for the more data and also information uh, that's provided by Asian Development Bank and also we'll update you guys very soon. So we'll take a very short break and then when we come back uh, the last segment of ASEAN Daily will focus more on the social culture part of Southeast Asia. <laughs> ASEAN Daily's first and the foremost news from Southeast Asia. Welcome back to Drian ASEAN. You're with Grace at ASEAN Daily's. And also Gauri here joining you today. Right. So the last segment of ASEAN Daily's uh, this morning is oh, we can start with this um, very tragic news. Uh, it's really heartbreaking news as well. And again, it's... Um, 
uh, regarding these animals, wild animals. Uh, they are called Maasai lions. Uh, there were people, uh, two men, have been charged after allegedly poisoning this famous pride of lions in the Narok, uh, which is southwest Kenya. And my question here is, why do you want to poison these animals? I mean, have they hurt you or have they attacked you before? And what is the reason? I mean, do you want to sell their body parts to some Mm. Uh, what is the reason of all this and it's really cruel when <clears throat> you are disturbing the whole animal ecosystem right and I totally agree with you it is very cruel and uh, actually apart from the two lions uh, that died they found eight other lions that were poisoned as well and they have been uh, they are being treated at the moment mm -hmm. for poisoning uh, and the lions are thought to have killed uh, three of the herdsmen's cows when they entered the reserve and th that is why uh, they were actually poisoned so mm -hmm. that they would uh, stay away from the farm uh, and the Kenyan Wildlife Service also warned that other animals might have been affected but the lions are actually uh, from the famous Marsh Pride and they were also featured on uh, BBC Wildlife <coughs> Program The Big Cat Diary uh, and they are known also to be right. uh, sort of like the famous lions mm -hmm. uh, in the region in the Maasai uh, region and it seems one of the two lions killed was uh, called Bibi, a 17 year old female lion right. and uh, a BBC Wallaf crew found her uh, foaming at the mouth and also fitting uh, and panting for, and she was out of breath. Uh, the other was disfigured beyond recognition after being eaten by hyenas after uh, it was poisoned. Uh, a few other lions were missing as well, uh, as reported by uh, David Sharrick Wildlife Trust, and her two-year-old cub is also being treated by the vets at the moment. But I mean, mm -hmm. it seems like they did it for protection reason like yeah. that the cow that the sorry the lions attacked the cows, but. Isn't poisoning taking it a bit too far over <laughs> here? I guess so. And at the same time, perhaps there should be a fine line between uh, killing those mm. <coughs> wild animals at the same time, protecting your own pets or um, uh, of the farming, animal farming of nearby your area. Because of course, uh, these wild animals, they follow their instinct. When they, s when they see uh, cows or sheep, they will just go and just catch them <laughs> mm -hmm. because that's their uh, a very uh, th that natural yeah. instinct but however what we need here is we need to uh, perhaps uh, to build a better infrastructure to protect all those animals from uh, being attacked by all these uh, wild animals or they have they needed to be educated where uh, certain animals they should not really harm because they will disturb the whole ecosystem. Mm -hmm. That's another steps that they can perhaps look forward because when they, uh, uh, especially BBC, that uh, they have documented uh, these uh, beautiful lions and. Um, it's very saddening to just read their Twitter post mm -hmm. and uh, to be able to, uh, I mean, uh, um, send out their announcements that, you know, it was poisoned to the listeners or even viewers. It, it affects the whole, uh, sort of, um, the respect mm -hmm. and also, uh, the, the preserving the wild animal system. That's true. Uh, I think that definitely poisoning <coughs> the, uh, poisoning the lions is taking it a bit too far. I mean, I know that lions are wildlife creatures, and I'm in no position to to defend right. that. And I mean, we don't live in the vicinity of lions, and I yeah. cannot really imagine how that feels. But I do agree with you that there has to be a better way to contain uh, your herd, you know, your mm -hmm. cows, and keep them away from the lions. So. Um we move on uh, to the next news about Uber. Well, this very famous and very popular uh, car services, uh, they will have, uh, they already received the green light from Jakarta, and which is quite a positive news because Jakarta is very well known having very bad, bad traffic there. Mm -hmm. And uh, with that, uh, to operate this, um, the Indonesian capital after this assurance that they will have the, this, uh, the Uber services, uh, and also the, 
they are, they asked for the other requirements as well. So Jakarta police had earlier uh, deemed the U.S. car hailing service uh, as illegal, saying that it uh, the drivers did not pay the correct taxes and the company did not have mm-hmm. the license needed to operate this form of public transport. As this uh, was already stated here. It had happened in uh, many other countries, including Malaysia as well, yeah. because it was not reg- registered legally and officially, and then drivers um, are still get uh, they are still paid for what they uh, uh, did. Mm-hmm. So it was really unfair on the, the taxi drivers and any other public transportation system. But uh, it seems that Jakarta had finally uh, sort of agreed. Uh, g- giving the green light to Uber service. Yeah, I think the main issue here, even in Malaysia, the fact, the reason that it's going <coughs> back and forth all the time from green light to red light and sometimes amber <laughs> light, I don't know. Uh, the main issue here is that we never really thought that something like this was going to, to come, something yeah. like this was going to exist. And that's why we never really had laws to regulate it. And people always think that, okay, hailing taxi, you just go to the road, you hail a taxi. Right. But... Uh, you know, things change according to times. And it's mm-hmm. 2015. Uh, everything is technology-based these days. Everybody wants to just hold a phone and uh, get everything, you yeah. know, be able to access everything through their phones. And taxi is probably one of the most important things you need when you're rushing to work, to class, whatever it is. Yeah. And it's definitely more convenient to have it on your phone. Uh, but of course, it's something that's very new and uh, they probably don't have enough legislation, even if Uber wants to register properly properly. Uh, as, as a company and pay the taxes, it will probably take some time to regulate that because uh, it's not something that's been done before. Yep. And, uh, of course, it definitely affects the existing taxi systems, not just Indonesia, Malaysia, but even uh, cabbies in New York are, yeah. are complaining uh, that Uber is taking over their livelihood and they're not making as much money anymore. Uh, I, th- uh, I think that what the government should do is try to... Uh, keep up with uh, technology and uh, uh, change and adapt the laws accordingly right. as we keep advancing. Mm-hmm. Uh, and it's, the world is definitely going to move more and more towards technology. Yeah. And I think we all need to brace ourselves for that to happen, not just with taxi services, but pretty much all other aspects of our lives. Yeah, that's very true. And uh, just to add on that, as uh, you mentioned about the other taxi companies mm-hmm. from different countries, perhaps we can just list down the one who are the competitors when it comes to Uber. And there are uh, US-based Lyft, China's Didi uh, Kwaidi, and Southeast Asia's Grab Taxi, and India's Ola. So those are the, the uh, existing uh, taxi services, and they have... Uh, 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 like sort of uh, been challenged by mm-hmm. this Uber company that it's growing very, very fast and aggressively at the same time. So in Indonesia, Uber will be operating in Bali, Bandung and Jakarta and all and those are the cities that are very well known for its traffic congestion and also lack of public transport. So um, according to the news that we are ha- uh, reading at the moment, uh, which is from Reuters, Uber said it planned to expand the most cities in Southeast Asia's largest economic next year and that they also would boost the number of its drivers to 100,000 by mm-hmm. 2017 from more than mm-hmm. 12,000 currently. I think Uber should just keep going. <laughs> <laughs> I mean that provides so far uh, mm-hmm. it has been providing very good services, good facilities even drivers are very friendly, mm-hmm. they're very accommodating so that's when the people are more attracted uh, to you use uh, the Uber services nowadays. So that's it for our news today at ASEAN Dailies. Look for us uh, via our social media channels, Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, and we have one more, which is Twitter. Yes. That's right. <laughs> and we also do have a website, rianasean.com for um, uh, more podcasts and more information. And also don't forget to download our very own Duran ASEAN app on your smartphone so you can listen to us anytime, anywhere.